and welcome everybody to this Eccles Centre Bryant Lecture, Falsehood and Fakery and the Threat to Free Speech with John Sopel. I cannot tell you how fantastic it is to be doing a Bryant event live after, <laughs> to be doing it live with you all here uh, after all that we've endured through COVID. But because we now also live in a hybrid world, it is also fantastic that we're able to welcome people live online from all across the world. So welcome everybody wherever you are listening to this wonderful lecture. My name is Polly Russell and I'm the head of the Eccles Centre at the British Library. And I'm just going to talk for a few minutes about the Eccles Centre and the Bryant Lecture. Um, and then I'm going to hand over to the Chief Executive of the British Library, Rhody Keating, who's going to introduce John. The Eccles Centre was set up in 1991 with a generous endowment by Mary and David Eccles. It was set up to foster and encourage scholarship and learning about the Americas using the British Library's world-class collections. And I just want to take a moment at this point to thank all the partner institutions that we work with, our amazing fellows, our friends, the American Trust for the British Library, and of course the Eccles family who support all the work that we do. The Eccles Centre works really closely with colleagues across the British Library to deliver a whole host of activities. We sponsor researchers of all types from all over the world. We fund two really significant writers awards worth £20,000 each for unpublished works of fiction and non-fiction. We create activities and services for students and teachers and we also do a huge amount of programming of events. And I like to think that if you are interested in the Americas, we would like to hear from you. Tonight's event, the Bryant Lecture, is one of our most important events of the year. The Bryant Lecture has been run since 1995 and was named, named after uh, Douglas W. Bryant. Douglas Bryant was born in 1913 and studied at Stamford. He served during the Second World War uh, as a Marine, an officer in the Marines, in the Navy, and sorry, and he, uh, and he, after that, he went to work as an associate librarian at uh, Berkeley in California. In 1950, he was um, drafted into the US Foreign Service to work uh, as, uh, f with British American libraries in Britain. He came back after two years and he went to work at Harvard, but over the many decades that he worked in Harvard, uh, in the library there, which he became the director of, he remained very close to British librarians and academics. And in 1979, he set up the American Trust for the British Library, which he served on as trustee and executive director, and then the president from 1990 until his death in 1994. In 1995, our annual lecture was then named after him in recognition of all of his work and support of the British Library. So the Bryant Lecture is a really important event in our calendar. It gives us an opportunity to showcase and explore debates about the USA and its relation to the world with some of the world's leading experts. Former Bryant speakers have included Lonnie Bunch, uh, Gary Young, uh, Lisa, Lisa Doucette, um, Gordon Carrera, uh, Kimberly Crenshaw, and I'm absolutely thrilled that we're going to be adding John Sopel's name to that fantastic list. John's uh, going to speak for about 45, 50 minutes, and then he's really happy to take questions, so do think of anything you'd like to ask him. If you're watching online, you can add a question at the bottom of your screen. Um, and I'm now going to hand over to the Chief Executive of the British Library, Roly Keating. so much Polly thank you everyone for coming uh, and thank you as ever by the way to the Eccles family it's lovely to see, uh, lovely to see John Diana Catherine here tonight uh, really wonderful long-standing supporters of this institution the British Library is, as Polly says I mean we are among many other things one of the greatest collections to do with America and the Americas in the world and over more than 30 years now the Eccles Centre has really transformed understanding awareness and sometimes simple enjoyment uh, of the collections that we hold. Um, we could not be more delighted tonight to be welcoming to deliver this year's Bryant Lecture, John Sopel. John, I think probably everyone here knows, uh, has had a really remarkable, long, distinguished career uh, at the BBC, 
um, uh, although he left, he just told me two weeks ago. Um, and of course, that, uh, that career culminated in seven, uh, an unforgettable seven year tenure as the BBC's North America or America editor. And uh, that included, of course, all the turbulence of the Donald Trump presidency, the transitions at either end of that, uh, and all the debates that flowed about a, a radically changing society that affects us here and indeed the whole world. John's theme, his title tonight, is Falsehood, Fakery and the Threat to Free Speech. And that theme, I guess, is relevant and timely for countless reasons I don't need to enumerate here tonight. Um, but we have war on mainland Europe and all the propaganda associated with that um, and the fears and concerns that people of all generations around the world have are very much embodied in many of the debates we have around news uh, and news reporting. Um, so the theme also links to our major exhibition that we have at the library at the moment called Breaking the News, which traces some of these questions right back through the centuries, through centuries of news and news media, uh, right back to a very cunningly spun account of the Battle of Flodden in 1513. Um, it's on until uh, 21st of August, seven days a week, so if you haven't had a chance to see it yet, please do make, uh, make time, if you can, to come back to the library and, and visit Breaking the News. And if you are watching this around the country, I'm pleased to say that the exhibition has versions in many of our partner libraries around the country um, who come together under our Living Knowledge Network. So if you can't make it to London, I hope you'll see a version of it uh, near you. I will be back uh, on this stage uh, in about 40 minutes or so to join John and to um, host some of your questions. Uh, but now it is my pleasure to welcome to the stage to deliver this year's Bryant Lecture, John Sobel. John. Um, good evening. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me. I'm absolutely delighted to be here. Uh, as Rowley said, I left the BBC two weeks ago. On the 10 o'clock news, I would get 50 seconds. Uh, to have 40 to 45 minutes seems an unbelievable luxury, and I have no idea how I'm going to time myself, but we'll see uh, how we um, get on. Um, I'm delighted to be here in the Eccles Centre, and you know, having spent seven years in the United States trying to explain to a largely British audience, some of the subtleties about the US and the relationship between the UK and the US. I know that the work that the Eccles Centre has been able to do over the years has been so important. There was a time, I guess, when calling the President of the United States a liar or the British Prime Minister untrustworthy was simply unthinkable. They were, after all, the holders of distinguished public office. But Trump did lie. And Boris Johnson has, well, a long and rather troubled relationship with the truth, of which Partygate is but the most recent example. So what happened? Did they become a reflection of our values, or have we stopped caring about what is truth and what is fiction? Perhaps the more important question is how has this happened, and what can be done to turn the tide on falsehood and disinformation, and the seriousness of the consequences if we can't. And that, I think, is what I'd like to address this evening. The focus of the lecture was going to be on the events that led up to the 6th of January, arguably the most precarious day in the history of United States democracy. But after the invasion of Ukraine, I said I felt we couldn't simply focus on what happened in the United States alone while ignoring the tanks trundling into a sovereign country and the missiles that are raining down on it as we speak. Um, so when we agreed that there would be a bit of Russia as well, I started thinking about what are the commonalities between the United States and what happened there and commonalities with Russia. There's a drama I've been watching on TV about America's first TV chef, and it's set in the 1960s. And the problem they have in this Boston TV station, some of you have clearly watched it as well, is you've got a 25-minute transmission but if you're making a boeuf bourguignon, it takes three hours. So how do you cut from one to the other and just make sure that, well, here's the one I prepared earlier? 
And then it occurred to me that this is to some extent what we've seen in Russia and America. In the US on January the 6th, we saw the raw chopped ingredients, an untrue message from an outgoing president that there'd been widespread fraud, a support base numbering tens of millions that believed everything he said, a polarized media that would churn out Donald Trump's claims unchecked, and social media whose algorithms amplified the most far-fetched conspiracy theories. But then you come to Russia. Sir Jeremy Fleming, the head of GCHQ, gave an interesting lecture in Australia recently in which he talked about Putin's modus operandi. I quote, he seeks brutal control of the media and access to the internet. He seeks the closing down of opposition voices and he's making heavy investment in their propaganda and covert agencies. This is the beef stew fully cooked after hours in the oven. Russian media has spoken with one voice. There is no dissent. Messaging is utterly consistent. This isn't an invasion. This is a special military operation. The regime in Kyiv is full of Nazis, even though its head is Jewish. Genocide has been committed in the Donbass, though no evidence has been supplied to the United Nations of such a claim. NATO is hell-bent on invading Russia, though it is a defensive alliance. Vladimir Putin has been able to carry out this war of choice knowing that the overwhelming majority of the population would never doubt his rationale for doing so. Every night on the TV news, trusted anchors repeat these lies. Likewise, the newspapers. Any voices of dissent are shut down and threatened to 15 years in prison. And if any opponent, of course, gets too big for his boots, there's always Novichok. To be clear, I'm not comparing Russia with the United States. Look, there's all, never been a great history in Russia of a free press, robust, protected by the First Amendment. Nor am I seeking to suggest, of course, that Donald Trump is Vladimir Putin. Though, frankly, at times I thought maybe he would quite like to be. But a free press able to criticise its elected leaders is a vital element of our democracies and a vital check on would-be and wannabe autocrats and dictators. I was at the news conference that Putin and Trump held in Helsinki together after their summit. It was unbelievable. The US president looked to be in raptures to be sitting next to his hero. When asked about Russian interference in the 2016 election, the US president said that Vladimir Putin had assured him it wasn't happened. I don't see any reason why it would be Russia, Trump said. President Putin was extremely strong and powerful in his denial today. That despite all the US intelligence agencies speaking with one voice that Russia had intervened. And so given a straight choice between believing his own intelligence agencies and believing Vladimir Putin, Donald Trump chose Putin. Now, when I was in Washington, there were those Republicans who would argue that Donald Trump had been tougher on Moscow than any other president. I always said, provide me the quote where Donald Trump is critical and it doesn't exist. Criticism of Theresa May, that was to a penny. Justin Trudeau, it was everywhere. Macron, the same. Merkel, well, he couldn't barely disguise his contempt for Angela Merkel. But Putin, nothing. And it was almost as though the more authoritarian you were and the more you could intimidate opponents and the press, the more Donald Trump admired you. Erdogan in Turkey, Xi in China, Duterte in the Philippines, but Primus in Tapares, Vladimir Putin in Moscow. So like the strong men he so revered, Donald Trump did try at certain times to ban journalists from the White House. Um, the BBC was once banned from a briefing. Um, anyone who caused him displeasure, he tried at times to limit their access. But with its written constitution and the sanctity of the First Amendment, he failed. So how is it in a country where there is a free press and there is huge diversity of opinion that so many came to believe that an election had been stolen and were prepared to invade Congress and come to Washington fully tooled up. I just want to rattle through a few facts of the 2020 election. When I say the election was not stolen, that's not me saying it. That is every person who was entrusted by the Constitution with the counting, confirming and verification of the results. The Trump campaign brought 63 court cases to challenge the results. 62 of them were thrown out wholesale. 
The Attorney General, William Barr, fiercely conservative, who believed in almost unfettered executive power for the President, said there had been no fraud and that would alter the course of the election, and has since said that Trump had surrounded himself with sycophants and, I quote, whack jobs from outside the government who fed him a steady diet of comforting but unsupported conspiracy theories. The election security head said it had been the safest election in American history. He was appointed by Donald Trump and is a Republican. 50 secretaries of state validated the results. The vice president, Mike Pence, would have nothing to do with an attempt not to certify. The White House general counsel told Donald Trump the game was up. But Donald Trump, with an ever-shrinking coterie of, well, whack jobs, to use Bill Barr's descriptor, maintained the lie that the election was stolen and he invited his supporters to descend on the Capitol on January the 6th with a tweet promising it was going to be wild. On that, it was promise made and promise kept. It was wild. But despite the total lack of evidence, astonishingly, a majority of Republican lawmakers in the House of Representatives voted against certifying Joe Biden's clear election victory. Now, all but a handful knew absolutely that Joe Biden had won fair and square. But they were terrified of incurring the wrath of Donald Trump and the harm he could do to their re-election chances if they voted against. There should be a whole separate lecture, maybe next year, on the power of fear in politics. This is Machiavelli's, it's better to be feared than loved, although with Donald Trump, he loved to be loved as well. So let's talk about America today, 16 months on. There's now a commission of inquiry into the events of January the 6th that shed a lot of light on what unfolded and why. Let us be in no doubt, there was a concerted effort by a small and powerful group of Trump supporting acolytes to overthrow a free and fair election. The House of Representatives investigation sent some initial findings uh, to a district judge to see whether he thought the law had been broken, potentially by Donald Trump and those around him. The district judge, David Carter, wrote that Donald Trump and others undertook a coup in search of a legal theory. A coup in search of a legal theory. Think about that for a moment the most powerful, freely elected leader in the democratic world standing accused by a US judge of a coup attempt. And some of what was explored by the team that had now coalesced around Trump was frankly the stuff of banana republics and totally frigging bananas. Um, but it failed, largely down to a lack of organization. Some have argued it showed the robustness of the US constitution and the separation of powers. I'm not so sure. It was very close to a full-blown constitutional crisis. So where have we got to now? Good news first. Um, latest poll figures suggest that around 60% of Republicans still believe that the election was stolen, but 40% don't. Well, let's say that's an exaggeration. Say it's 50-50. That means there are still 37 million adult Americans who believe that Joe Biden is an illegitimate president, that he shouldn't be in the White House. And these are people whose faith in democracy, having been fed this diet of untruths and downright lies, is now diminished on the back of no evidence. To state the obvious, we live in deeply divided societies, though I'd argue that Britain, though it's had its moments, Brexit was deeply divisive, is not in the same place as the United States. I could give endless examples, but I'm going to give one. Before I left Washington, there was an election for the governor of Virginia. Virginia had been Democrat for a number of years. Uh, the Republican was doing well by kind of sort of being Trumpian, but never mentioning Donald Trump's name. Um, a poll just before the election found that the Democrat had a 14% lead amongst those people who'd been vaccinated. Most people in Virginia had been vaccinated. He lost the election. And what it meant was that virtually everybody, I mean like everybody, who hadn't been jabbed voted Republican. 
how, whether you'd been va your vaccination status was an indicator of your likely voting behaviour. Slightly frightening. Things may be bad here, but they're not like that. There's a fascinating piece that's just been published in the Atlantic magazine after Babel. It's called by a social psychologist, Jonathan Haidt. It invokes the story from the book of Genesis and the Tower of Babel, where God is so angered, angered by our hubris, he scrambles our languages. Haidt sees a metaphor for what is happening, not only between red and blue, in other words, Republican and Democrat, but within the left and within the right as well, within universities, companies, professional associations, museums, and even families. In the past 10 years, he writes, something went terribly wrong, very suddenly. We're disoriented, unable to speak the same language or recognise the same truth. And he worries, and I quote again, that if we do not make major changes soon, then our institutions, our political system and our society may collapse. Maybe that's a bit apocalyptic, but you can see where he's coming from. So let me go back to the question I posed earlier about why so many voters still believe that the election in the US was stolen. And I think this goes to something fundamental. As we've become more polarised over Brexit, Trump, Ukraine, you name it, so an increasing number of people tune into the news, or maybe more particularly click on stories on their timeline, not to be informed, but to have their views affirmed. I find that frightening. There's a growing intolerance to viewpoints that are not their own, on the right and on the left, and in identity politics, and frankly, everywhere. Early in that 2020 election campaign, I went to the Mexican border uh, to interview Steve Bannon for the Today programme. Um, the abuse I got from the left on social media was off the scale. This is not a nobody. I let me say that again, he is not a nobody. He was Trump's campaign manager in 2016 and went into the White House on an equal footing as the chief of staff. He was in many ways the intellectual underpinning of Trumpism. Unless we forget, Donald Trump had been for four years the most powerful elected politician in the world and leader of one of the two global superpowers. But people complained in their hundreds that I was a fascist enabler. Did people die in the gas chambers so I could interview this Nazi? And on and on it went. I'm sorry, to ignore Donald Trump or anyone else you don't like doesn't make them go away. I did reflect that in the mid-1990s, at far too young an age, I'd been invited to present the Today programme, did a few shifts. And one day, sitting opposite me in the studio was Radovan Karadzic, now serving a life sentence for war crimes for his role in the atrocities in Bosnia. He was in London and he was in our studio for the Bosnia peace talks. I think we have to listen to views that we might find repellent and people like myself must challenge those views robustly, toughly, fairly, but we can't pretend they don't exist. Cancelling people from your curated timeline, from your university lecture theatre, from your consciousness may make you feel better but it's counterproductive. We need to listen to people we disagree with because if we don't, we'll never understand the support they command and why. So I took up my post in Washington in 2014, the last two years of the Obama administration. And when I moved from London, I thought of CNN as a bit like the BBC, a small L uh, liberal. But with Donald Trump's election victory, that shifted. I remember vividly his first presidential <coughs> press conference. He's arrived at the White House. He's in the East Room and I was there. He was in a feisty and confrontational mood and I kind of had my hand up. He said, you? And I said, John Sopel, BBC, where are you from? And I said, BBC News, you know the beauty. And I said, well, uh, we're free, fair and impartial. Yeah, just like CNN. And, and I thought, <laughs> I am not going to rise to the bait, which is what he wants you to do. He wants you to start slugging back. Um, I wanted to push back, I wanted to be firm, but it seemed important to me to be polite and respectful, even if he wanted to treat me with disdain. 
it seemed important not to be provoked. But I have to say, large sections of the US media were provoked by Donald Trump. He kept on calling us fake news, liars, the most dishonest people he'd ever met, and with those chilling sort of Stalinist overtones, enemies of the people. It suited Trump's purposes for us to become the opposition to him. It fired up his base. He had a deliberate strategy. Believe me, there was a lot that Donald Trump did that was just winging it and seeing how it landed. But on this, he had a deliberate strategy, and that was to undermine confidence in the media so that people wouldn't believe us, they would believe him. And the fake news taunts have been picked up with alacrity by autocrats and dictators around the world as a means of suppressing a free press, which they have done. Last week saw the publication of the World Press Freedom Index. It charts each year countries that are performing well and those doing badly, and it makes depressing reading. A record 28 countries are rated very bad, and of a total of 170 countries, which warns that autocratic regimes are increasingly willing to crack down on independent media outlets. I should say Britain was a respectable 24th on the list, but even here, when politicians get a tough question, there seems much more willingness by the parties to say, oh, well, you're just a conservative cipher, or you're just a Labour supporter, when we are doing our job. And I think the politicians who try to suggest that we are asking them difficult questions because we're partisans, I think they should know better and should be ashamed of themselves. In the US, I'm afraid too many news organisations took the bait to become Trump's enemy, and the president rubbed his hands. News anchors on CNN and on MSNBC were almost in competition with each other to find new ways to describe Donald Trump as an idiot, an imbecile, a liar and a cheat, an embarrassment and source of national shame. I remember after one evening rally, it cut back to this CNN presenter, uh, Don Lemon in what we call in television an MCU, a mid-close-up shot, and it cuts back to him in the studio, he's just going, <laughs> what an embarrassment. I mean, what an embarrassment for our country to have him as our president. I mean, by all means, get guests on who want to say that, and, but when the anchor, who is meant to be holding our hands and kind of telling us what's happening in the news is saying that, I think that's not a great place uh, to be. Initially, I think that was born of frustration with Trump, what he was doing about the ban on people from Muslim countries, the building of the wall, etc. But then it morphed, and this is important. It may have been a misguided editorial reflex at the start, but it soon became a business model. In essence, monetized the anti-Trump sentiment, just as Fox News, OANN, Newsmax were seeking to cash in on support for Donald Trump. So it seemed that there was be a race on the liberal side to be the most anti-Trump. And then I kind of I went to a baseball game at Wrigley Field in Chicago, and the guy I was with was the editor-in-chief of a number of newspapers, and he was like, oh, yeah, I just don't think we're cashing in properly on the anti-Trump sentiment, and we need to get more good anti-Trump writers. Um, uh, uh, the New York Times, its, edit, its comment editor, commissioned an article by Tom Cotton, who is a Republican Arkansas senator, he was forced out for having done that because maybe the New York Times thought the readers were too sensitive to read the views of one of the hundred elected senators to the upper chamber of the US Congress. Extraordinary. And this sort of censoring goes on today on both sides. As I say, news here is a commodity to sell and you know your market and you give your market what they want. Affirm, don't inform. The other point to make, and this might seem kind of trivial and compared to censorship, is that good journalism relies on nuance. The best reporting is when we say this might look black and white, an open and shut case, clear as day, but yes, this would appear to be a Trump slash disaster for Donald Trump, Joe Biden, Boris Johnson, but it's a bit more complicated than that, and this is why. But populists and those who do their bidding don't paint with a pointillist brush in different shades. They just slap it on with a broad brush in primary colours. And I think that that doesn't help understanding either. The manner in which we do this job is important. 
If we sound like we're the opponents to a political decision or political party, then don't be surprised if his or her supporters migrate away from your TV channel or radio station and go to one where they hear what they want to hear. We're not the opposition to anyone. In America today, the Republicans are the opposition to the Democrats. Labour is the opposi official opposition to the Tories. We have, and that we don't have and shouldn't have, a dog in the fight in so far as we're journalists. But we have to report what, to the best of our endeavours, we have proved to be true with facts, with judgments and due diligence. And we must do that fearlessly and firmly. As Daniel Patrick Moynihan, a politician who worked for both JFK and Richard Nixon, said, you're entitled to your opinion, but you're not entitled to your own facts. And we must also report impartially. I think under the framework of the regulator Ofcom, it's seriously what marks us out for the better from the US. Until 1987, uh, it was similar in America, uh, but during the deregulation, of the Reagan era, the Federal Communications Commission ditched the fairness principle for TV companies. Um, and that allowed companies like Fox to come in and correct what they saw as the liberal bias in the media. But we must never equate impartiality with weakness or wishy-washiness. Impartiality doesn't mean that journalism is bland or insipid. It can't be he says, she says, only time will tell. Some people say two plus two is four. Some people say two plus two is six. Only time will tell. John Sobel, BBC News, wherever. <laughs> two plus two is four. We need muscular impartiality. And I say this to my BBC bosses as well. On day one of the Trump presidency, my former BBC bosses, sorry, that's, that's kind of mindset. On day one of the Trump presidency, I was at the White House uh, doing a live for the evening news, and it was suddenly Sean Spicer, the president's first press secretary, calls a news conference, unusual for a Saturday. I go, and in he comes, and he says, you've got it all wrong. The crowd for Donald Trump's inauguration was the biggest in American history. Well, it wasn't. And you just had to look at the photos from... 2008, when Barack Obama's inauguration took place, or 2009 rather, and you could see that hundreds of thousands of more people had turned out on the mall uh, for him than for Donald Trump. And that posed us in the BBC with a bit of a dilemma. Were we going to say Sean Spicer claims this, but the photos suggest that? There was some discussion, but we said, no, we're going to call this as it is. It's not true. Now, of course, it brought criticism from partisans that we were engaged in Trump bashing, that we were biased. That's not right. Because to have said anything else would have been a more serious crime, and that is going in for truth bashing. And journalists must never do that. There have been times, however, that I have been a little more uneasy with some of the BBC's uh, reporting, and I've never spoken about this before. Uh, prior to the Brexit vote in 2016, when Barack Obama came to London, uh, I was travelling with him on Air Force One. By the way, if any of you have thought about what is the quickest way to get from Stansted Airport into central London, and you've debated, do I go the M11 or do I go take the train into Liverpool Street, can I commend you to a US Marine Corps helicopter parked <laughs> at the side of your plane, which whisks you into the back garden of the US Ambassador in Regent's Park? It took 15 minutes. No need for passport control or anything like that. Really excellent. Um, <laughs> I digress. Uh, the news desk wanted me to file a piece on Obama's arguments about Brexit and why it shouldn't go ahead. And so I filed my report and the editor in New Broadcasting House said, nice piece, John, but it's got no Nigel Farage in it. So I thought about that for a minute. And I, so I thought, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go for passive aggressive rather than, well, I said, I didn't get to the very front of Air Force One, the Secret Service wouldn't let me, but as far as I could see, Nigel Farage wasn't on the plane. Um, I'm sorry, you've got to include some Nigel Farage in it because every piece has got to be internally balanced. Um, I just don't think that's good reporting. Um, and I made my views known to the bosses that be, and I was told that was the way it is. That's a cop-out. It felt like a policy to appease, to get rid of BBC critics. I don't think that is going to get rid of BBC critics. And this isn't me making a pro-Brexit or anti-Brexit point. It's then saying, 
that to go in for false equivalents is not good journalism. If 10 Nobel Prize winning economists say that Brexit may be a disaster, do you give equal space to that view than from the lecturer from Neesden Polly who says, no, no, Brexit's going to be a huge success? Or if all the leaders of the top FTSE companies say it's going to be a disaster, a bloke who runs a pub chain, does he get the same amount of coverage, for example? Um, or in the... Just hypothetical. Or in the war in Ukraine, do we say on the one hand Ukraine calls this an invasion of their sovereign territory, but on the other Russia says it's a special military operation and leave it at that? No, we have to call it, just as the UN Secretary General said that Russia has breached international law by violating the sovereign territory of another country. To use a phrase from a previous visionary Director General of the BBC, John Burt, that shows a bias against understanding. But perhaps the greatest bias against understanding is coming from social media right now, which is the greatest source of misinformation. The 2016 presidential election which brought Donald Trump to power was remarkable for all sorts of reasons, too many to go through in this time. But we saw in all sorts of ways the proliferation of disinformation on Facebook from seemingly reliable sources of stories that were, to use the technical term, total horseshit. Pope <laughs> backs Trump, according to one radio station, that didn't exist. Hillary Clinton wanted on murder charges. No. Um, the post-election analysis showed there were some pretty weird and less than wonderful actors in all of this. For a start, the Russian state was seeking to sow discord and do whatever it could to undermine Hillary Clinton's election chances. And by the way, just at that news conference that I was talking a moment ago in Helsinki, Vladimir Putin said in terms, yes, we wanted Donald Trump to win and we were doing what we could to harm Hillary Clinton. But bizarrely, there were kind of students in Macedonia who found it was a good way to pay their tuition fees. You write clickbait stories of pure, absolute nonsense. People click on them and the more dollars you get. And there were, of course, the people who either wanted to skewer Donald Trump or skewer Hillary Clinton. There was one particular story I remember vividly about a paedophile ring alleged at the heart of the Democratic Party involving John Podesta, who was Hillary Clinton's chief of staff then, and, of course, Hillary Clinton. It all apparently is centred on a pizza restaurant in Washington, D.C., about a mile or two from where I lived in northwest Washington. Um, there was a dungeon in the basement of said pizza joint, and the children were being taken there and imprisoned and then abused by said Democrats. Now, this was a piece of total invention that started out life on the furthest reaches of the internet and ignored by everyone who came near it. But then a few people decided, oh, this could be useful, so they gave it a push. It then migrates to one of the message boards, I think it was Reddit, and before you know it, bad political actors pick it up and it is on... Uh, people's Facebook feeds. Harmless? Well, one guy read about this and the poor children, and he loads his AR-15 assault rifle into his car from North Carolina and drives the hundreds of miles to Washington, D.C., where he walks into the restaurant, fires a round from this uh, uh, high-velocity round into the ground, and said, I am here to free the children from the basement. Well, the, unfortunately, the pizza restaurant didn't have a basement. There were no children and he ended up in prison for his troubles. But this, in essence, was the start of QAnon. Q allegedly being a senior official working in the government who was going to expose the paedophile ring at the heart of the deep state. It was going to be like the second coming. And anyone who believed in QAnon believed in Donald Trump, most memorably the shaman on January the 6th who stormed the Capitol in his horned helmet and the fur pelt and the tattoos all over his body um, and who got three and a half years in prison for his troubles. If you haven't listened to Gabriel Gatehouse's astonishing uh, podcast series, The Coming Storm, I do recommend it. Um, it is really unbelievable way that it charts that the more fanciful the story you tell, the more likely it is to be picked up by people who want to believe in, in conspiracy theories. Uh, my old friend David Aronovich, who now writes for The Times and does all sorts of wonderful things, wrote an excellent book about conspiracy theories uh, called Voodoo Histories. It predated Donald Trump, but its essential thesis was that those who believe in conspiracy theories are the marginalised, the outliers of society, the alienated, the dispossessed. 
But that has changed today. Donald Trump is not what you'd call one of the marginalised. But he's promulgated theories that Barack Obama was an illegitimate president because he was born outside the United States, untrue. The American, American Muslims were filmed in New Jersey celebrating after 9-11, untrue. And right through to the stolen election, untrue. Not as bad as Marjorie Taylor Greene. I don't know whether any of you have come across Marjorie Taylor Greene. She is the Republican Congresswoman from Georgia's 14th uh, district um, who argued that the Californian wildfires were started by, wait for it, Jewish space lasers. I don't know how a space laser is Jewish <laughs> or why, but apparently it involved George Soros and the Rothschilds family and everything else in between. I don't know whether she knows it's nonsense, but it's picked up by thousands of people who lap this stuff up. The algorithms of social media mean that the wacky, outlandish, absurd conspiracy theories get fed into your timeline as though fact. They get posted on message boards and are disseminated to communities of like-minded people who are exposed to no other opinion. A more terrifying will hear no other viewpoint. The Facebook whistleblower Francis Horgan produced thousands of internal documents seeming to show that social, the social media giant... Uh, and the company's internal culture prioritised profitability over its impact on the wider world. And she warned that Instagram, like Facebook, which is owned by Meta and used by millions of children worldwide, may never be safe for pre-teens. And she said much of the blame for the world's increasingly polarised politics lay with social networks and the radicalising impact of services such as Facebook groups. She wrote, I'm deeply concerned that they have made a product that can lead people away from their real communities and isolate them in these rabbit holes and these filter bubbles. What you find is that when people are sent targeted misinformation to a community, it can make it hard to reintegrate into wider society because now you don't have shared facts. Again, shared facts. Now, of course, the social media companies say they're seeking to deal with this. And I know that many are working incredibly hard, pulling down thousands of fake videos that are online about what is happening in Ukraine. But a lot of them are very sophisticated. There was one a week or two ago that had BBC encryption all over it. The BBC font size was right. It all looked absolutely pucker BBC, put out by the Russians, and it was fake to damn to do down the Ukrainians. And it takes a long time to identify some of this stuff. So I think there is work that is going on and that things are moving slightly in the right direction. And it's true that the social media companies have rules for their communities and they're doing to, going to take more responsibility for egregious material that appears. Both Facebook and Twitter kicked Donald Trump off their platforms over the repeated false claims around 2020. But now we have Elon Musk, about to buy Twitter, who says that Donald Trump will be welcomed back and that this is a platform for free speech. I am all in favour of free speech. I think it's absolutely vital. But there are limits to free speech. Someone comes into this theatre now and shouts fire, that is going to cause problems and it will be against the law. So you can't just say, it's, it's fallacious to think that you can just say whatever you like, whenever you like. The social media challenge, I realise I've dealt with somewhat scantily, but I was talking to Eric Schmidt last week, the former CEO of Google, and he says that there's an awful lot more that the companies can do themselves in the way that the algorithm works, in the way that stories get amplified. And there are also the attempts of governments to legislate in this area, like our government is doing with the Online Harms Bill, which would give Ofcom powers to demand information and data from tech companies including on the role of their algorithms in selecting and displaying content so it can assess how they are shielding users from harm. I think there are attempts to deal with this, but I think we are in the foothills of the misinformation battle and the deep fakery that goes on. There's a really wonderful exhibition about news here, which Rowley really spoke about uh, in the British Library, which, you know, it takes a 500-year view of some of the things I've been trying to address this evening. And one of the sections is where the transfer of information today is so fast that things go viral in the click of a finger. If a story seems too good to be true, it probably is. 
although Waggate and Wagatha Christie, that is pretty good. Um, we need to learn to take a breath as well as journalists. Rather than following the latest tweet or the latest thing that has been posted, maybe do we just think for a little bit, is this true? Maybe we actually find out if it's true. Because that is a way out of the tidal wave of the nonsense out there. It's far easier to set out the problems than the solutions. I have loved my nearly four decades as a journalist. I honestly think there has never been a more difficult and challenging time to be a reporter, and never a more critical or important time. My grandparents came here as refugees fleeing persecution. I found out only last year that one branch of my father's family decided to stay behind and they ended up in Auschwitz. Britain and the other liberal democracies have their problems, sure. But we must never take for granted all that we have here. Free speech, due process, open and fair elections, equality before the law, the peaceful transfer of power, and a media free from state interference. And yes, we can go on and talk about an education system and a health service free at the point of delivery. I've never seen it as my job to tell people how to vote. If you want to vote Labour or Tory or pro-Brexit or anti-Brexit, that's absolutely fine by me. I fully accept that intelligent, reasonable people can reach totally different conclusions and viewpoints on the best way forward for society. But I do care passionately that people who go into the polling station are doing so with good information on which to make their judgment. To use that phrase from Francis Horgan again, that people have shared facts, not their own truth. The first half of my life was in the shadow of the Cold War and the slightly comforting feeling that mutually assured destruction gave us. The commies wouldn't blow us up because we could destroy them and vice versa. Then just over 30 years ago, the world changed, the Iron Curtain fell away, and with some historians declaring that the end of history had arrived. Liberal democracy and Western capitalism had triumphed. There would be an endless peace dividend. I feel today there are no certainties for the next 30 years. The values of liberal democracy are not immutable. We saw the vulnerability of a democracy as sturdy as America's last year. We've seen the respect the Russians have for sovereign nations with the invasion of Ukraine. We have seen the potency again of populist leaders with control of the media promising simple solutions. I feel we need to shout from any platform that we can find that democracy will perish without a well-informed electorate, and that in part requires strong, robust, independent journalism. To me, this feels like the battle of our times. The stakes could not be higher, and I believe it's a fight that can and must be won. Thank you. Thank you. That was that was fantastic. I, I, it was inspiring and disturbing in almost equal quantities, and I suspect we're all just computing and digesting what some of what you've been sharing with us. Um, I think we should have the lights up because we've got about 20, 25 minutes for for questions and, and conversation with John. It's a rare privilege. So um, uh, let me see in this beautiful red glow that I've been given. Um, uh, okay, I'm going to take a first question uh, in the orange shirt just there, fourth row back. Uh, the, the, yeah, just there. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Can you hear me? Good. Yeah, I can hear you. Fine. That was Can't see. That's all right. I'm doing that. <laughs> That's all right. Um, that was absolutely amazing. Um, the question I really wanted to ask was relating to your uh, description of balance and equity, um, because it seems to me that that has been a major problem, especially for the BBC, the idea of giving equal weight to truth and, let's put it this way, things that aren't exactly the truth or might well be absolute outright lies. And do you think that, for, that it's caused a lack of faith and trust in the BBC? Because 
that's how I have felt. I have felt that I can't trust them as much anymore, especially over some of the treatment of, say, a particular individual that was in control of his party at the time and the kind of press he got. And there's a difference as well, I think, would you agree, there is a difference between the, pr um, the newspapers and the, uh, the um, uh, televisual uh, journalism, etc. Yeah, um, so the, thank you very much. That's a really big and important question. I mean, the last bit first, I think that, yeah, th of course, the newspapers are totally different. I, 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 and, but I think that newspapers, it's easier. I mean, you know, some of them blur the lines, of course, but I think, you know, you've got the comment pages. When on television you get somebody who is just outright giving their own point of view, and how do you know when it's become news? I, I'm watching the telly, this bloke told me it was the case, so it must be true. Um, I think it's very difficult to, to go between comment and journalistic reporting, impartial reporting. Um, I, I don't like the idea of false balance. I, you know, I kind of remember during the, you know, the Bosnia war game back a few years, and you know, it was just like, oh, there's a symmetry of guilt. They're all as bad as each other. I mean, that's just lazy. Uh, and I think that the senior journalists, not, you don't want every journalist making a judgment because I think that then it starts to be reporting. But I think it is my job to say, well, this isn't true. And I think that if you, if you are convinced of something and you've seen the facts, you don't say he says, she says, well, let's, let's see what happens in, as it, we go along. You've got to say this isn't right. And I think that maybe there have been issues that broadcasters have ducked when they shouldn't have ducked. And I, but I, but the corrective to what I would say, and, and you know, I, I, I think the BBC is still a fantastic organisation, and, I, I, and I'm not going to be one of those who leaves the organisation and attacks it, because I think it's wonderful. I think that, there, that as we have become more polarised, unless we hear the view that we want to hear about, you know, you think Boris Johnson has done something terrible, well, I want to hear the BBC tell me it's something terrible. Or you want to, you believe Boris Johnson has done something fantastic. I want to hear the BBC tell me it's something fantastic. Um, and I think that we kind of, we now get impatient, and I was trying to argue that, about, you know, we, we become intolerant unless we hear what we want to hear, and I think that's worrying. Thank you. Um, more questions, and I should say, if you're watching um, at home or online, you can also uh, put questions in the chat room, and we'll try and pick up one or two. Um, Yes, I'll make sure I don't miss any at the back, but yes, hand up there and then I'll come to you, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for such an interesting talk. I was wondering, um, without necessarily giving away your political leanings, um, what is your news diet? I mean, do you watch breaking news? Do you follow news online or do you stick to radio bulletins and newspapers? Oh, God, it's... it's I mean, I kind of read any old rubbish. <laughs> um, I mean, I... I'm, you know... I'll be honest, I'm not on the far furthest reaches of One America News Network and Newsmax. Um, but, I, but when I was living in America, I watched everything because it was important. And actually, I would, I would, I would I'd watch MSNBC, which is, the most, let's say, the most liberal. I think, oh, God, I can't bear this. And then I'd go to Fox News and Sean Hannity and think, oh, I can't bear this either. And then you kind of think, I've got nowhere to go. And that's a really bad thing, because I think that people just didn't expose themselves to anything that didn't confirm their own bias. So I read a lot of newspapers. Um, my wife, who's here this evening, would, spend, I said, would confirm that I spent, spent far too much time on Twitter. Um, and, yeah, guilty. And, uh, but I try to read as much as I can from a different... Because I think it's important that we get diffuse viewpoints. Thank you. Uh, second row... Down here, I think, and then more hands up, please. Thank you, John. My name's Glenn Tarman. and I work for a fact-checking charity called Full Fact. Good for you. Um, thank you. Um, I wanted to just speak about um, the rules. You spoke a lot about media practice and expectations of how the media operates. You spoke about the online safety bill. Unfortunately, the bill that MPs are just about to look at will allow misinformation at huge scale. We're deeply worried about it. Tomorrow, we're publishing a letter with Francis Haugen uh, to the Prime Minister, because charities won't be allowed access to the data of what's really happening on these problems, uh, on these platforms. We think children's charities and others should know. It shouldn't still be a secret. So there are problems there. It isn't looking as good as it should be. And part of the objection is the free speech advocates. I mean, we're, we're for freedom of expression. 
we think that good information should be available for, to, for people, but they are scared of regulating. They don't want to be seen to be regulating what would stop bad information circulating. So I just wondered if you had any views on what more rules could be in place. We've seen in Parliament, ministers are supposed to correct false claims. Prime Minister's made claims repeatedly and no, he's not held to count to actually correct the record. Ofcom, they've got rules to, uh, for news, impartiality and so forth, but that's based on a law 20 years ago. There's a whole TV stations called Something News right now that don't have to fulfil those obligations. So it seems like the rules aren't keeping up as well as the practice. So I just wondered if you saw anything that could yeah. be done in that area. I, so I don't, I've been back in the UK six months, so I don't want to start going into the detail of legislative policy in Britain about what needs to be done, because I think I'd be out of my depth pretty quickly. Um, it's undoubtedly true that the social media companies have grown at a rate that policy and law has not been able to keep pace with. And I think, and I think with AI, we're going to confront that as well over data collection and what it means. And, and you know, you look at some of what is being done in the field of artificial intelligence and you realise that it could become, you know, it could be a great force for good, but it could also be used by bad actors. And there is no regulatory framework, it seems to me, that's in place to deal with any of that. I think that there are there are rules that are there but are not being applied as well as they could be. And, uh, you know, just as I've called for muscular impartiality in, 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 in that lecture, I think that there should be kind of, a, that, you know, governments around the world need to be a bit more muscular about some of these things. But I think that, you know, you sometimes think, well, is this, are they being muscular because they are dealing with the wrong of misinformation or is it because they feel that, the, you know, the, the, the government is not being very nice to them? And the social media companies have got enormous power. And it's, you know, there is, there is, I, I kind of salute anyone who's trying to deal with it. Now, um, whether Nadine Doris has got everything absolutely right, <laughs> I'll leave that hanging. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'll come back to the room in a moment, but I think maybe let's take an online question, Polly. Yeah, this is a question from Tim Mountford. Uh, John mentioned Gabriel Gatehouse's excellent podcast, The Coming Storm. Listening to that st series, it struck me that the elephant in the room that Gatehouse avoids explicitly calling out is a resurgence of supernaturalist religious explanations for human events. Is religious opinion the last taboo that an otherwise secular news journalism won't touch for a fear or offence? Um, that's interesting. I think that, uh, I mean, one of the interesting things about, you know, my job in America is that here you have a, a country where there is a strict separation between uh, church and state, yet no politician could get elected without discussing their relationship with God in the Iowa caucuses. Um, and, and they do. And they go to Bible study groups to show how much they've studied the Bible. And, you know, can you imagine? <laughs> I was, I mean, just let's leave it. Can you imagine Boris Johnson doing, you know, his relationship with the Bible <laughs> as part of his campaign in Hillington, in Uxbridge? struggling somewhat um oh, but but i mean even any other political leader i mean blair was very religious but he never wanted to you know discuss god um you know alistair campbell famously saying we don't do god um i think that is something that is a very big difference between the us and the uk which was one of the things that fascinated me you know where i lived in georgetown there are about 21 churches within 400 meters of where we lived and god is big business in them in America um, and you know an awful lot more people much higher percentage than in the UK would describe themselves as religious compared to here thank you um, Polly we'll come back maybe with another let me know but let's have some more hands up in the room and um, uh, well let's first go to the row behind yes just there second row thank you Peter Gordon, I'm um, a trustee of the Voice of Reviewer, which is a, a charity which is promoting a public service broadcasting. Off the trade, so if anyone wants to give us any money, feel free. Our question is: um, um, You mentioned a couple of things. Um, do you think the problem in the US started with, like, with media deregulation in 1987, or whether um, social media is more to do with it? 
Um, leading on to that, how do you actually solve the problem? Do you think the problem can be solved, or is it a genie that's out of the bottle? In other words, if social media changed algorithms, would that help? Will people simply go and get sources which, uh, which um, reinforce their beliefs? If change the, uh, you know, if, if, if Facebook changed their uh, their algorithm, become less so, 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 so you go elsewhere. So, in other words, the problem would still exist. I mean, great questions. I think that um, it's. N I, I really don't want my speech to be a council of despair. I, I want it to be hopeful because I, I genuinely think that. You know, if, if people could get back to some decent reporting, that there is a sense of trust, that the people you are hearing from are not kind of all evil, venal people, um, that we can have a shared truth again, um, then, you know, we can get back to a more regular dialogue. And I, and I would love to think that America frightened itself on January the 6th, uh, Last year, I'm not sure it did, and that worries me. But I kind of think that there is a. It's very interesting to see what will happen because I think that there are arguments that you know look, Donald Trump is still a hugely influential figure, and he has not moved on from the election was stolen, and that anyone who says otherwise, I think there is a bit of a peeling away from that, and certainly among the Republican leadership, there is a feeling that okay, we've done that now. Joe Biden has been the president. Can we talk about what America looks like after 2024? And that's the way we will win an election. So I think it's possible that some of it comes back. Um, and I think that the social media companies, uh, you know, that look, they are there to provide a return for their shareholders. That's their principal thing. And they know that the algorithms that pump more and more weird and wacky stuff into people's timelines is what is going to get keep people looking for longer. Um, at, at, at their output. And so I kind of think that, but I think there is a recognition as well that among the social media companies that the status quo is not good enough. And as I said, you know, there are big efforts being made, I know, to pull down fake videos. From people I know in that industry, they, they are taking it incredibly seriously. Is it an uphill battle? Yes. Is there a long way to go? Yes. Do I think it's hopeless? No. Thank you. Um, uh, more hands up. I'm um, up this row and just four rows from the back. Let's take a hand up there. Hi, John. Uh, Mark Shanahan from Reading University. Uh, I'm feeling suitably educated, informed, and entertained this evening. <laughs> Who would um, have ever used a slogan like that? <laughs> Who knows? Quick question Should Donald Trump be given a second chance on Twitter? Be Elon Musk's advisor here. Yeah. Um, well, he said he doesn't want to go on Twitter. That's almost that. I kind of felt myself doing that answer and thinking, I'm a politician now. I've just <laughs> completely swept. That's a very important point. But let me ask a complete answer to a completely different question. Um, I think that there are. You have to accept there. I mean, look, the danger is gone now. The the election has been certified, and Joe Biden is in the White House. But uh, uh, it was a pretty hairy moment. And you've got to say what price American democracy, what price this, the, you know, the shining city on the hill as America likes to describe itself as this sort of, you know, the kind of firmament of democracy and a written constitution and all the rest of it. Um, I think that, let me put it another way. I'm, I'll answer a different question like politicians do. Uh, yeah, should the people who abused the England players who missed the penalties be allowed to just express what they want to without sanction and free to go their own way. I kind of think that's an abuse of free speech and I think that there is, you are encouraging hate and you're encouraging falsehood and I think there has to be some parameters. Now, the thing that um, Eric, Sch Eric Schmidt said to me, the, the former CEO of Google, was, you know, look, if we just didn't amplify this stuff, then, you know, it would be there, but it wouldn't get the same number of clicks and likes and otherwise, and there are ways that you can fix it like that. So, you know, you have at real Donald Trump back on Twitter, but you don't have it getting quite the prominence uh, that it did. I'm not sure I've quite answered your question <laughs> because I don't. Uh, I sort of. I, I, I think there are limits to 
what should happen and if people are undermining democracy and by falsehood, then I think that you've got to call that out. Got time for some more questions in the room, but we're going to take another one um, online first. I think this one's slightly linked. This is from Craig, and he says, as modern politicians in the UK continue to flaunt tradition, does the lack of a British constitution put our free speech more at risk than North America's? Well, I, I, I try to argue that I think that actually we're in a better place here than we are there, but we can't take anything for granted. Um, I think an unwritten constitution has, broadly speaking, served this country well. And I'm not sure that having a written constitution and the three co-equal branches of government and all the rest of it, um, and it's a brilliant document, the US Constitution, I'm not sure that's what saved America. The Constitution actually turned out to be very brittle and it kind of almost got to snapping point. And but for the actions of a few good people who just thought that their, their primary responsibility towards, towards the Constitution and not Donald Trump, it could have been a very different story. And I'm, you know, I'm thinking of the kind of um, the Secretary of State in Georgia who Donald Trump rang up and you know, Brad Raffensperger, who said, you know, give me another 11,780 votes, which was the margin that Joe Biden had beaten him by. Um, you know, that is now being under investigation for election interference, which would be an imprisonable offence, and Donald Trump is under investigation for that. So I don't think that having a written constitution necessarily saves you from bad actors. I think it is the kind of the will of the people to stand up for what you believe to be right that is really mattered, and politicians behaving responsibly and accepting. You know, it was clear to me in 2020 that Donald Trump only believed there could be two possible outcomes to that election. One was that he won, the other was that it was stolen from him. He was never countenancing defeat, and he still can't accept it. We've got about five minutes left, so I'm keen not to get as many questions as I can in. I'm going to take... Um, well, one right at the back, because they always miss out otherwise, and then I uh, will uh, row three from the See, this is how democratic the British Library is, that it does the cheap seats as well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Um, I wanted to know uh, what direction do you think the Republican Party are going to go in uh, in 2024 uh, with the, their nominee? Do you think it'll be Donald Trump again? Um, what type of competition do you think he'll have in the primaries? Okay, I, I, I will shoot, that's a great question. I will shoot the breeze on it without kind of, I, I personally, I'm, come back to me in two years' time when I'm completely wrong. I think the high watermark for Donald Trump has been, I think that for various reasons, he will end up not standing again. I think the people who will stand against him will be very different from the group who fought him in 2016, because then, in 2016, the Ted Cruz's and the Marco Rubio's and the Jeb Bush's had no idea how to deal with Donald Trump. And I think they would do so now. Uh, but I do think that whoever the Republican candidate is will be Trumpian. Because I think that the base of the Republican Party is still very much there. Look, as things stand, if Donald Trump runs, he wins. Because the support is there. But I think that there has been a peeling away from Pompeo, his Secretary of State, the governor of Florida, a very interesting guy who's almost outflanking Trump in some of the populist measures, but is very shrewd and smart, much more disciplined than Donald Trump was. So I, I think it will be a Trumpian person. I don't think it will be Trump. And I think that the Republican leadership in the Senate, they just want this to go away. I, you know, as I said, no one believed, or very few people believed that the election was stolen but they, want, they just didn't want Donald Trump to destroy their careers. And it's been interesting what's playing out in America at the moment, where there's some mixed results, where people that Donald Trump is back it, uh, backing for primaries, the extent to which they're winning or not winning, will be a kind of important indicator of how much Trump still has. Thank you. Uh, third row um, from the front here, just if you pop your hand up, we'll get the microphone to you in just a second. Perfect, thank you. This Getting close to the last question now, but please go ahead. Do you want to start? 
Smith and the Phil Davies Fellow here at the Eccles Centre. Thank you so much for your talk. I strongly agree with you about the need to interview and understand, uh, try and understand uh, people that we disagree with. But I wonder what you thought about the argument that in 2016 in the campaign, the media gave Trump an unfair advantage by giving him so much free airtime, especially impacting the primary. Yeah. And, it, it, and just, just imagine for a minute, you know, you're an academic, but you're, you're not a TV producer. But you're a TV producer. And in, the, in your gallery, you've got this bank of screens. And one's got boring old Jeb Bush. And one's got boring old Marco Rudy there. And they're all about to give stump speeches. And one's got Ted Cruz. And the other one's got Donald Trump about to speak. There was jeopardy with Trump. You didn't know what was going to happen next. And so you put him on endlessly. I think just to say that the media gave him too much attention, and that's why he won, is to kind of simplify what I, I, I happen to think that Hillary Clinton was an awful candidate and she couldn't explain why she wanted to be president, whereas Trump would say, I'm going to build a wall, I'm going to kill, keep Muslims out, I'm going to renegotiate trade deals, and I'm going to treat veterans better. And people said, oh, OK. It was clear. And Hillary Clinton could never answer clearly what the reason was. There was then the reopening by the FBI of the email, you know, all the rest of it. Um, so I think the reasons were complex. I think Donald Trump was a better candidate in 2016, and he was more powerful. And I don't. There's a play on at the old Vic at the moment called 47. Have you seen it? Yeah. So it's fantastic. But what you realise is, you you you're sitting most at, on the edge of your seat when Donald Trump is on stage, the guy who's playing Donald Trump. And when it's somebody else, you, when it's Biden or, or Kamala Harris, you go, <laughs> it, you know, Trump was electricity. And there was, a, a, and so yes, the media did give him too much free coverage. He hardly had to spend anything on advertising. He was also, interestingly, I'm sorry, I'm getting, I'm wasting time here. No, no. Uh, what I thought was fascinating, right, particularly in the primaries, was that, you know, you always thought that in American politics, it's all about money. Trump hardly spent any money compared to Jeb Bush. And Trump absolutely trounced Jeb Bush. And I think that, you know, there was just something about Trump and that moment in history that people wanted change and was, you know, screw everybody else, screw conventional politics. Yeah, did he molest women? I don't care. I mean, I, did he pay his taxes? I don't care. He's a non-politician politician. And they gave him incredible latitude. And I think whether the TV companies had given him a lot of coverage or not, I don't think would have affected the outcome. I'm going to steal time for one quick yes. fire question if anyone has a final one. Um, where are we? Yes, front row here, please, sir. Thank you. Hello, thank you. What, if any, similarity do you see between Donald Trump and Boris Johnson? <laughs> thank you. <laughs> there we are. Quick fire question, John, to conclude us. <laughs> I think the fascinating thing is that there are there look there are undoubtedly similarities between Trump and Boris Johnson, but there are also very big dissimilarities. Um, and I think that when Trump, there was a story about Boris Johnson having left his car outside Carrie's flat when they were getting together, and that his car windscreen was just splattered in parking tickets that he'd never paid. And it had never probably occurred to Boris Johnson that he couldn't park on a yellow line. <laughs> and that there were rules that applied and he didn't know them. I always felt that Donald Trump knew that he couldn't park on a double yellow line, but was, did, did it anyway. <laughs> I think that, that I think Trump was more, con I think it's a sort of, I mean, I'm trying to, it's a trivial example, but I think a serious one. I think Trump was conscious of what he was doing. And I think he, did it for darker reasons, where Boris, well, well, I can just do what I like and say what I like whenever I like, and it will be fine. And I think that there's um, a big difference there. And Boris is much better read, and he's, you know, and I think that I think that at heart, Boris is a sort of broadly speaking social liberal, um, and sort of does care a bit about the environment and does care about these things. Whereas I don't think Trump did. John, thank you. I'm afraid the clock is against us and we're going to have to uh, leave it there. Um, and I've been going to ask, are you optimistic or pessimistic? But I think what I've taken from you, I think cautiously, what, cautiously 
I'm hearing a bit of inspiration that if we hold to certain values, we yeah. can just... Yeah, let's not lose sight of those values. So, let's, yeah. so I think on that cautiously optimistic note, could you please both thank the Eccles Centre and John... <laughs>